Father in heaven, we come to you this morning as a family, kneeling before you, acknowledging that you are our God, and we are your children. We come to you with assurance of mercy and grace. You have created us, and we are your creation. We come humbly before you, acknowledging that. This morning, as we pray as a church, we bring to you all the things that trouble their minds, our lives. There are many who have um, are suffering, and we're not just talking about physical suffering, but emotional and mental anguish. Many of us are not here this morning. They're in different parts of our community, in different parts of the country, and even of the world. We know that you, as our Creator, has plans to restore humanity to its original Eden-like creation. And currently, we don't see that in our world, full of turmoil, wars, and rumors of wars, illnesses and famine, even in our modern world. And that we know that these things will happen. We know that Jesus will be coming soon in the clouds of heaven, and we look forward to that time when everything will be back restored to the original. This morning, Father, I pray that the message that um, will be delivered is not my words, but your words. I pray that you use my, my mind, my heart, and my mouth to deliver the message, and that with the Holy Spirit, mere words can transform and change the heart of even our stubborn hearts. We look forward to the time when Jesus comes to, in the clouds of heaven, and that will be indeed a day of hallelujah. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the things that I was thinking of this morning when trying to get the, the message across, I didn't know it was going to be alumni weekend. Um, as you can see, there's not many of us here. Most of them are in Central Valley Christian Academy Gymnasium celebrating that. My daughter and her class is up in Seattle. Um, they're doing the music tour. They will be back tomorrow, uh, Sunday night. So my story this morning, and my message this morning, is about daughters. If you open your Bibles with me, um, open, uh, open the, the books to the, the book of Mark. Um, most of you are familiar with this story. This is the story of Jairus and how his daughter was resurrected from the dead. So that will be in Mark 5, verse 21. Turn your Bibles there, please. The title of my sermon is A Long Wait. Let me introduce you to this concept of waiting uh, and ask a question. Have you ever waited for a long time? I mean, last, let's see, well, that was three years ago, after the pandemic, two years ago, actually. 
where we went to Florida, to Disney World, and you waited in line for a long time. Two and a half hours for a two-minute ride. Imagine that it was hot, humid, and I was wondering whether it's worth it or not. Once we waited for my daughter to take a picture with one of the Disney characters, it was for four hours. Or have you ever traveled in an airplane, sat on a tube with pressurized air with 200 or 300 other people for 10 to 12 hours with a baby crying the entire trip? It's a long wait. <laughs> On top of that, I had one of these flights from Chicago to Arizona, and it was turbulent the entire time. I was holding onto my seat like this, scared. Or have you ever waited for a medical test? The results of it, is it gonna be good news or bad news? Or some of us have waited for loved ones to come home, say from Iraq, during the war, or right now, where they're wondering whether they'll be okay or not. It seems like as human beings, we're destined to wait. As soon as Adam and Eve ate that fruit, we become servants to time. Waiting is our lot. So one of the um, things that I would love to accomplish today is to encourage, uh, because the thoughts that come into my mind when I was putting this sermon together was you know, I've, I've been waiting a long time, and you all have been waiting a long time for the coming of Jesus, right? And we sang today, Jesus is coming again, right? So, I mean, if you turn to John 14, 1, 2, and verse 3, Jesus said what? I will go prepare a place for you. And... When I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I mean, if Jesus lived around the 31 AD, that's almost 2,000 years ago. We've been waiting. It's a long wait. The Adventist church has been established almost 180 years ago. Our very name says that all. Seventh day, the Sabbath. Adventist. Advent, we've been waiting. So it's a long wait. So let me get into the story in Mark because they were waiting too. Two sets of people waiting, one shorter than the other, but still waiting. And if you start reading in verse 21, John or Mark 5, let me put the setting of the story. So Jesus was in the middle of his ministry. I think before this event, he was doing the Sermon on the Mount. And if you read Matthew 5, it's a profound message. After that, they crossed the lake in a boat. And remember what happened there? A storm came by. The disciples were scared. And Jesus said, peace be still. And the storm calmed. And the disciples were asking, who is this man who, who even commands? the weather. Then on the other side of the lake, they, uh, Jesus heals uh, a demon-possessed man. 
Then they came back. Well, while the boat was still approaching the lake, there were already crowds waiting for Jesus. Because you see, um, there was a lot of miracles performed between this time and before, and the word is spread that Jesus was a healer. So, when they docked at the shore, it says a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders by the name of Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Now, Jairus is a synagogue leader, a, a Pharisee, right? And for him to kneel at Jesus' feet is very significant, right? This is a man who, or at least their group, believes that Jesus is not God. But this man, he was desperate. Now, the reason why I chose Mark 5, the story, is if you read about Mark, the Gospel of Mark, the writer is uh, a person by the name of John Mark. He was actually spent a lot of time with Peter. And Peter is one of the witnesses of this event. So you can read about the story in Matthew. That's in Matthew 9, 8, 18 to 25. Or you can also read it in Luke 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 40 to 56. And what each of the stories is, will tell you little details about the event. Just like three different witnesses, okay? But Luke spent time with a person that was actually there, Peter. So I like the story of Mark because it tells the details and the essence of the, the message this morning. Verse 23, uh, he pleaded earnestly, he, I mean Jairus, pleaded earnestly, my daughter is dying, please come. Verse 24, so Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed around him. A woman who was there, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors that had spent all she had. She was bankrupt. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Now, let me tell you about this during research. Um, bleeding at that time, the modern term for that is dysmenorrhagia. A lot of women suffer from that. Now, I was talking with um, one of our, my um, OBGYN colleagues the other day and saying, hey, you know what? I read this article about ancient times and treating of dysmenorrhagia. And she goes, oh, you know what? Even in India today, in rural parts of India, when women have their menstrual period, they don't have tampons. They have to sit on rags and let the bleeding take its course. It reminds me, if you read back in Leviticus, right, that when women have their menstrual period, they have to be isolated, away from the camp, for seven days. They cannot sit with anyone, they cannot touch anything, as they consider the blood a contamination. This lady has had it for 12 years. And this menorrhagia, um, by the way, it's, it's a Greek word. It's a put together word. This meaning dysfunctional, painful. Meno means month. 
And rhea comes from the word, we know diarrhea, right? Flow. This lady was having this for 12 years. And I could imagine um, that this lady, um, in terms of her age, she was probably between 12 years old and 40s. She had to be in her fertile age to have this happen, okay? She was likely anemic at this point, meaning her blood levels low. She was poor because she spent all her money with the doctors. And some of the symptoms of anemia, including fatigue, easily tired, right? You don't have enough blood. You're weak, you're malnourished, and you spend most of your days washing rags to sit on. I don't know where she got her food, but people back then were generous enough to give her food, so that's her sustenance. If you read in Mark, she approached Jesus as invisible as possible, right? In fact, here, if you read in verse 27, when she heard about it, she, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his cloth. It's not lawful for a woman that has bleeding, this menorahia, to touch anyone back then. The equivalent illness that we can picture is the picture of leprosy. You cannot socialize, you cannot touch anybody, you cannot and you're shunned away from the population. She is completely isolated. Her family probably disowned her. She is infertile. She can't have kids. And being a woman back then, right, they're considered things. A man owns them. But she's probably disowned because she has this chronic illness. In verse 28, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Because you see, she heard Jesus going around healing all, everybody. Right? The blind was able to see, the lame was able to walk. Prior to this, a man with leprosy was healed by Jesus. In verse 29, when, um, when she touched Jesus' clothes, now in Luke, if you look at it, it says the hem of the clothes. The way she approached Jesus was likely, with the crowds around, she was crawling on the ground. She is weak, malnourished. There was a lot of crowds. The only way she could get through was to crawl on the ground and touch the hem. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt her body that she was freed from her suffering. She felt strong. Her fatigue went away. Her depression probably went away. I mean, who wouldn't be depressed? And verse 30 said, At once Jesus realized that the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Have you ever been touched in your clothes and real, you know, do you recognize that? Most of the time you don't. And of course, the disciples were there. Peter, I think in, the, in, in, in Luke's version, right? Peter says, are you kidding me? Right? That was the, the gist of the expression. Jesus was in the middle of the crowd with crowds pressing on him, and he dares ask, who touched me? Verse 32, it says, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. 
Now, did Jesus know that this particular woman touched her, touched him? So we know, it's like, it's like when God went to the Garden of Eden, right? And Adam and Eve were hiding, and it says, where are you? It's a rhetorical question. In verse 33, then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Why was she trembling with fear? She was terrified that she violated the rule that you cannot touch anybody. She was just healed. She knew she was healed, but yet she was afraid. It's the opposite reaction, right? And then to me, the key verse of this entire story happens in verse 34 of Mark. Jesus, he said to her, in quotations, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Now, if you read the entire Gospels of the Bible when Jesus was here uh, on earth, this was the only time he calls a woman daughter. Did you know that? In fact, if you go on further down the story, when he gets to Jairus' house, he calls the girl little girl. Then he says, I say to you, get up. There was some, I think if you look at Matthew, um, Matthew 9.2, there was an incident where a paralytic was lowered from the roof. And Jesus heals him, but before he heals him, he says, your sins are forgiven. With the Pharisees there questioning this entire time, who can forgive sins? But in that, ver in that verse, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. But that was the only time as recorded in the Gospels where he says son. I, I think that they are equivalent, son or daughter. Your faith has healed you. Now, this, this term daughter is significant. Because some speculate that this is a term of generic term, you know, like daughter of Israel. Hey, daughter, but why not call her woman? They didn't know each other, right? So one of the things that Jesus was keenly aware when he heals this lady is that he was not only curing her physical ailment, You see, this woman was a social stigma. The term daughter there, as if, of, is this, to me, this is from my reading, that daughter here is more a term of endearment. It is as if the father is telling the daughter, your faith has healed you. Let me go back a little bit. There was two daughters in the story, right? One is a daughter of Jairus. One is a daughter that Jesus called. Jairus' daughter was about 12 years old. She was just entering puberty. We know that the age of this woman who touched Jesus was probably between 
at least 12 years old and 40, this age of fertility, that's when desmenorrhagia occurs. The daughter of Jairus was healthy. She had a, what you call an acute illness, and she was dying. A healthy, healthy, healthy child, and then boom, dying. This other woman, she had a chronic illness for 12 years, and this menorrhagia, you can describe that, that's not only bleeding, but what? There's cramping, there's pain, there is, you know, there's all kinds. I mean, the doctors at that time, one of the prescription was, you know, uh, taking fennel, for example, or putting some warm compress down in the abdomen, massage. If you read the history of medicine, Hippocrates knows about this condition. There was theories on how this is. One of them, of course, was uh, that you know, there must be some blockage in the cervix, and that's why all this is happening. And the, and the treatment for dysmenorrhagia is conception. Well, this, this woman was infertile. In math, here in the story, she said she went to many doctors. I mean, I could imagine someone who was desperate for a cure, right? Anything will do. I mean, even in modern times, we have illnesses that we can't cure, right? And what happens? We grasp for cures, whatever it is, right? Same here. Both daughters, both women, one the daughter of Jairus, this other lady, they're both from a Jewish tradition. We know that Jairus and his family are leaders of the synagogue, so this daughter was a prominent member of her family. They were at least wealthy, right? This woman was bankrupt financially, emotionally, psychologically. She's the complete opposite of this daughter. Could you imagine Jairus, the father? You know your daughter is dying. And you know that Jesus, he believed in Jesus, right? Because he said, come, just touch my daughter and she will be healed. Expression of faith. But you gotta hurry because she's dying. And I could, just I could just imagine Jairus saying, why did this woman have to stop Jesus? Right? She was sick for 12 years. I mean, another hour or two is not going to make a difference, right? But Jesus did stop. If you read the story more and more, right, Jesus comes after this incident. He comes to the house of Jairus, there were already professional group of weeping people, right? So that means that the, that the girl was dead for hours. She was gray and cold and probably going to what you call rigor mortis, stiffening. There was no doubt she was dead. In fact, after this incident where Jesus heals the woman, right? If you, or if you read the story, there was a messenger. Verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, speaking to the woman, right? Some people came from Jai the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, saying, your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? The presumption is that, what? It's too late. Jesus can't possibly heal death. Why bother the teacher anymore? But Jesus heard this. He said, particularly likely to Jairus, he said, don't be afraid. Just believe. Have faith. The way this woman was healed was in the street, and it's a very public place. When Jesus got to Jairus' home, right, 
in verse 37, he just said, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. And the parents. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with the people, this is in verse 38, and wailing loudly. 39, verse 39, he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead, but asleep. In verse 40, he said they laughed at him, and after he put them on all, all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went, went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Gum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around, and she was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. In verse 43, the story closed, he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Now look at the contrast. This woman who touched Jesus touched him publicly, hoping that she'll remain anonymous. The little girl rose from the dead in a very private setting. The little girl woke up hungry, and she was fed. The woman was cured and was afraid. There's two different daughters here, and their stories couldn't be more opposite. But one of the things that struck me about this story Oh, let me go back a little bit. You know, when this child was born, when she was just given birth to, this woman was, was already suffering. 12 years she was suffering. 12 long years. Bleeding, pain, isolation, depression, bankruptcy. This thought of when she said, in her thoughts, she planned all these things, by the way, because she said when she heard Jesus, if I could just touch his clothes, not even Jesus, the little girl was healed when Jesus touched her hand. The woman said, if I could just touch his clothes, even just the hem of the clothes, No wonder Jesus said, your faith has healed you. In Hebrews 1, uh, we define faith, right? Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is confidence that we hope for and assurance about what we do, not see. I like the, um, I actually like, there's, there's, I'll read to you a different translation because I like, I think the third translation, it closely resembles uh, the, the heart of the explanation. Um, the New English Standard Bible says, now faith is the assurance. New International Version said, confidence. But the New Living Translation says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for, a reality that has not come yet. But we're living in that reality. It is the evidence, evidence of things we cannot see. I get these Bible minutes from one of my friends, Dan Smith. He goes all over the place in the Philippines and does all these evangelisms. And even with that, he sends me. But He's always, you know, says that, you know, there's always a gap in faith, right? 
you can have this faith that something's going to happen, but you truly never know that it's going to happen. But, but the Living Translation, it is the evidence of things we cannot see. And this woman's, her faith is the same, right? The expression, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. It's a statement of fact, of truth. There was no doubt in her mind that if she did that, it will happen. Now, one of the things about when you read Revelation, right? When John describes the people in the last days, right? The saints. The expression is, the saints have the faith of Jesus. Think about that for a second. When Jesus said to the lame, rise up and walk, that is Jesus' expression of faith to God. He's human, right? Was there any doubt in Jesus' saying? Remember, he asked the Pharisee in the previous chapters, if you read about the paralyzed man, he said, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? It's easy to forgive, right? Think about it. I can say, hey, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you, sister. But to say rise up and walk, in front of everybody, and that man rise up and walk. That is a faith without doubts. See, Jesus was functioning at that level, right? When God said in the beginning, let there be light, there was light. Jesus' words and the actions or the events that follow are what? They're considered facts, truth, whatever it is. They happen, reality. And this is the expression of that woman. If I touch the hem of his clothes, I will be healed. And she was doing it what? As anonymously as possible. She crawled. Part of the fear that she was experiencing was what? He's not going to know I touched his clothes. But when he did, when he acknowledged her and called her daughter, like a father would call his daughter, not only was her physical illness, the bleeding, stopped, but what? He cured her depression, he cured her isolation. He cured her emotional need, her psychological need. He healed her completely. The wait for her is over in an instant. This change is very much perceptible physically. She felt it. So what do we do with this? One of the things that I was contemplating about was, you know, We've been waiting a long time. I can remember back in 1981 when my grandmother was still alive. I remember her very words. You know, by, I bet, you know, he said, I will tell you that Jesus will come in the year 2000. 
That was 24 years ago. I remember Ben Maxson five years ago now. He said, you know what? Jesus may come in the next two years. That was four years ago. And we're still waiting. It's a long wait. But here's the thing that, that I think that we're, that we're missing. God is immortal. When we were created in Eden, we were immortal. I think Eve and Adam and Eve believed that, yes, you know what? If we eat this fruit, we're going to have the knowledge of good and evil. Right? Time, for us, is good and evil. We have good times and we have bad times. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Time became our master. The devil knows it has a limited time as well, right? As soon as he was thrown down to the pit, earth, he knew he had a limited time. But see, if you are immortal, as God is, time is irrelevant. One of the most beautiful things about the scriptures is that when Jesus came into the home of Jairus, he said what? She is not dead. She's asleep. Now, let me tell you, you know, I, I, I'm an anesthesiologist, and one of the things that sometimes I do with patients is, right, before they go to sleep for the procedure, is that, hey, can you count down from 20 down to 1, right? 20, 19, 18, and then you give them the anesthetic agent, and they sleep. Well, in some short and even medium length procedure, you wake them up quickly on the other end, you pull out the, the, the tube, and guess what? They're still counting. 16, 15, 14. It has been two hours since they slept, The point is this, my father has died. I miss him sorely. My grandfather, my cousin's husband, my uncle. I've seen my part of death. But when Jesus described him as sleeping, right? Time is irrelevant. It's a long wait for us, not for them. In fact, if you look at in 1 Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians, I think it's uh, in 15, verse 51, 52. Paul says this, it's a mystery. Some of us will be alive when Jesus comes. Some of them, us will be asleep. But it's a mystery because in a twinkling of the eye, a blink, in a flash, because you see Abraham when he died 6,000, 5,000 years ago, to him it's just a blink of an eye and his next eye opening will be what? Jesus coming down in the clouds of heaven. Yes, it's a long wait. But there is comfort that some of us will be alive. Many of us will have slept. But those who sleep don't know that time passes. When Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Jesus cures not just the physical ailments, he cures everything, including our sins. Everything. That's why when he said, go in peace, he's not just talking about peace from suffering, physical suffering, mental suffering. 
In the previous chapter, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. So let me close with this. Open your book to Romans. Romans 5. Paul gives a more lengthy explanation of this daughter. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Romans 5. I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 11. And listen to the words. Therefore, right, the woman just expressed her faith, touched his hem. She got healed. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, in which we stand now. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God love, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This woman that Jesus calls daughter is now part of a family. She's never been like that before. You see, at the right time, and Jesus has impeccable timing at the right time. The path to Jairus' house from the lake must have been far because it took him a while. The daughter de- died, right? You see, at just the right time, verse 6, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if we were God's enemies, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled through him, through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received. Reconciliation. That, my brothers and sisters, brings us peace. No more doubts. I attended the sermon when, when the, the preacher said, you know, somebody from the street said, Are you saved, my brother? Are you saved? Am I saved? Absolutely. We are reconciled. And therefore, that reality should permeate our lives and we live as such. Whatever waiting time we have, whether Jairus was desperate, even for a short time, to get Jesus to his daughter, or that lady waiting 12 years, 12 painful suffering years, it's a long time to wait. but the assurance that we are saved should give us peace. Let's pray. Father, may we live with that faith. May we live justified and sanctified in that faith. Give us peace. Let everyone say, Amen.